Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about the very suspicious death of Joanne Romaine. Her name might sound familiar because this case was actually featured on Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. The specific episode is called Lady in the Lake and it was part of volume two. Joanne Romaine died in 2010 and the circumstances around her death are very mysterious and pretty controversial. The police believe that she committed suicide while her family thinks that the suicide theory is just a cover-up and that foul play was definitely involved. I first heard about this case through the Netflix episode and I watched it about two years ago when it came out and it always stuck with me because it's just so frustrating and when I started to look into it a little bit more, I realized that there were actually a lot of details that Netflix left out. So I will go over all of that in this video. Just quickly before we get into the case, I want to say that if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more true crime content. So Joanne Romaine, born Joanne Matuk, was 55 years old when she passed away and she was living in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan called Gross Point Woods, which is actually where she lived her entire life. And Gross Point Woods is a very wealthy area with a very close-knit community where everybody knows everybody. And Joanne absolutely loved it there. It has a lot of families that have lived there for generations and it's said that few people move away from this area. In 1980, Joanne married a man named David Romaine and they had three children together. Michelle, then Kelly, and then Michael was the youngest. Joanne was described as the best mom with the warmest heart. She was a really loving and supportive mom and always put her kids first. She could be overprotective at times, but that was only because she really cared about her family and she wanted to be as involved in their lives as she could be. She was also said to be a really good homemaker and she loved to cook and host guests and she was always having her kids' friends over. Apparently their house was the house to be at because Joanne was such a good host and this made her really happy because she loved to see her kids with their friends. Joanne herself was a very social person and had a lot of friends herself. She was always going out with her friends for lunch, drinks, coffee, and she just always had something going on with them. Joanne worked at a small boutique and was really well liked by her coworkers. And overall, she was just a really well liked person in her social circle and was pretty well known in the community. Joanne was really close with her extended family as well, like including her siblings and cousins. She had four siblings, but was especially close with her brother, John Matuk. John said Joanne had a great soul and was his favorite sister. And he said that she was just the closest person to him. And then in 1994, Joanne's mother passed away and this caused a lot of turmoil within the family. And this was because there were a lot of disputes over her estate and the inheritance, which was pretty substantial. Her mother's inheritance was to be split five equal ways among the siblings, but according to Joanne, that's not how it happened and the money was not dispersed fairly. So Joanne and John ended up suing the other three siblings over this inheritance and they actually won. But there was just endless fighting over this lawsuit and unfortunately the family never mended things after this and money just totally tore this family apart. But John and Joanne remained close because they had sided with each other over this whole dispute and they won the lawsuit together. Another important thing to know about Joanne is that she was a devout Catholic and her religion was really important to her. And her kids said that her relationship with her religion grew even stronger as she got older. And she would try to go to her church as often as she could. She would go every Sunday and would try to go almost every weeknight for the evening prayer services. And then in 2005, there was a big change in Joanne's life. After 25 years of marriage, she and David separated. Michelle, who was Joanne's oldest daughter, said that Joanne was just tired of being unhappy and that she just wanted to live a peaceful life. Apparently they just didn't get along well anymore and the relationship had turned pretty toxic and they were arguing all the time. Michelle also said that David was pretty angry at Joanne for leaving him. So let's fast forward to 2010, which was five years after David left. Joanne is 55 years old and is living with her three adult children in a very nice home in Gross Point Woods. Michelle was 29 years old, Kelly was 27, and Michael was 20. On Tuesday, January 12th, 2010, Joanne had gone to an evening prayer service at 7 p.m. at St. Paul Catholic Church, which was located on Lakeshore Drive in Gross Point Farms. 
As I mentioned before, she was a devout Catholic and she would try to go to these evening prayer services as many times a week as she could. And this was a really cold January night. Detroit winters are pretty cold, but this was an especially freezing cold night. The temperature was only 12 degrees and it was pretty snowy and icy out. And this prayer service ended around 7.15 to 7.20 p.m. And then later that evening, a police officer on routine patrol came across Joanne's car in the church parking lot. Her car was a silver Lexus SUV. He noticed that the church was dark and it didn't seem like there was anyone around, so he couldn't see any apparent reason why the car would be parked there. And then when the officer looked inside Joanne's car, he saw Joanne's purse sitting on the passenger seat. He then became concerned because there wasn't anybody around and it was pretty late on a weeknight and most women don't leave their purses behind. He returned to his patrol car and ran the plates and then decided to take a look around. So to describe this area a little bit, and I'll try to include as many pictures of the layout as possible. But basically the church was pretty close to a body of water, which was Lake St. Clair. And the water's edge was just across the street from the church. So it was like the church, two car lanes, a median, another two car lanes, and then a slanted concrete embankment that led down to the water's edge. So the officer looked around the church and couldn't find anyone. And then he thought that he would go down to the water's edge and check there because apparently it was pretty common for people to park their cars near the church and then walk down to the water's edge. Probably not as common in the dead of winter, but I guess good to check. Then he noticed footsteps in the snow that went from a nearby curb, like about 75 feet from the car, going towards the water and he decided to follow them. And then near the water, he saw that there were two prints in the snow that indicated that someone had sat down in the snow and it appeared that that person had slid down to the water's edge. And he couldn't find any indication that this person had returned from the water, like there were no other footsteps going the other way. Based on what he found, he thought that there was someone in the water. Over the radio, he reported the discovery of Joanne's car and requested assistance from his supervisor. They then contacted the US Coast Guard and a search and rescue operation began soon after that. Meanwhile, around 9.20 p.m., so two hours after the church service would have ended, Michelle was actually getting into her pajamas when she saw a car coming down their driveway. At first, she thought this was Joanne and was surprised it had taken her this long to come home. But when she looked outside, she saw that it was a police car. She answered the door and the police officer told her that they found Joanne's car abandoned in the church parking lot. He asked Michelle if Joanne was missing and of course Michelle said no. And then her children immediately tried to call her phone, but it kept going straight to voicemail, which meant that it was off. Then they started calling family and friends to see if any of them were with Joanne, but they all said they hadn't seen her and didn't know where she was. Michelle then called John, who was Joanne's brother that she was close with, and told him to get to their house right away. And when John got there, he, Michelle, and Kelly decided that they should probably go to the church to see what was going on. When they pulled up to the church, which was around 10 p.m., they saw police tape all around Joanne's car and the lot was filled with police. And they were pretty shocked to see how quickly the investigation had escalated. According to Michelle, the car was locked and the keys were nowhere to be found. They also noticed that Joanne's purse was on the front seat. And that's when it started to sink in that there was something definitely wrong because she knew that her mom would never leave her purse behind. Like they were probably still holding on to the fact that like maybe her car battery died and she got a ride or she had a spontaneous social event or something like that. But when she saw the purse, she got extremely nervous. By that time, the Coast Guard had kicked into action and there were helicopters and dive teams searching the lake for Joanne. Joanne's daughters noticed this and then asked the police why the Coast Guard was searching the lake. And that's when the police told them that they thought Joanne had walked to the lake and committed suicide by drowning herself. Michelle, Kelly, and John were in complete disbelief. They knew that their mother would never do this. And when they heard the news, they were just, that's crazy. They denied it immediately. The family reportedly begged the police to have canine units track her scent, but they told the family that dogs can't track scent in the cold. Um, but Michelle later found out that that was actually a lie. The police chief told the family that there were no signs of a struggle in the car 
or around it or around the footprints in the snow. They didn't find any evidence to suggest that a crime had been committed, such as torn clothing, items on the ground, dumped out purse, ransacked cars, scuff marks or drag marks around the scene, blood or bullet casings. The police did check the outside and inside of the car for fingerprints, and they said that there were no clear fingerprints, only smudges. But they didn't check the purse for prints, and we'll come back to that later. Coast Guard helicopters were called off around 4 a.m. after hours of searching and no sign of Joanne. The lake was apparently very calm that night and didn't typically have much of a current, and the Coast Guard was pretty certain that if someone had gone out there and drowned, they should have been able to recover the body. Joanne's family had no idea where she was or what had happened to her. It was like she literally just vanished. As I mentioned before, Joanne had a lot of close friends in the community, and Michelle said that when she disappeared, it was like the end of the world for a lot of people. The community put up flyers and a massive search began once the news broke. And there was an extensive three day long search of the lake for Joanne. And after three days, the dive team confirmed that Joanne was not in the water. And the dive team's director said the search for Joanne was the most thorough one he and his team had ever done. And on the night that Joanne disappeared, she was wearing a black blouse, black pants, a black coat, and black heeled boots. And because she was wearing all black, Michelle believed that they should have been able to clearly see her in the water if she was in there. And yes, Joanne was wearing four inch high heeled boots that night. So just to recap the police's theory, they believe that Joanne left the church in freezing cold weather in the dead of night, crossed the initial four lanes of traffic to the embankment, and then while wearing high heeled boots, walked down the snowy, icy embankment, and then slid five feet down the embankment to the freezing cold water to take her own life. There are so many issues with this theory. First of all, Joanne's family knew that she would never do this. She didn't have a history of depression or any mental illness. She wasn't on any medication and she she showed no signs that she was planning to do this. She just got out of a toxic marriage and was finally happy and she would never leave her kids. And she was pretty religious, right? Like suicide is against all beliefs in the Catholic religion. And there's just no way that she would do this at all, but especially not in front of her church. Like why would she do that? John says that Joanne is actually the one person he knows who would never take their own life. And he says that he knows that she would not walk away from her children. In the Netflix episode, they interviewed one of Joanne's friends that had had a phone call with her three days before her disappearance. And she said that Joanne seemed very upbeat when she spoke to her. Apparently they had a good laugh about something that happened in her friend's life. And when they hung up, they said their I love yous and that they would see each other soon. Her friend said that Joanne showed no signs of depression throughout their entire friendship and that they had been friends since high school. She said there was no way that Joanne would leave her children and that they were her everything and her whole life. When the police told the family their theory, they immediately started thinking about how it, it, it literally makes no sense why someone would do it this way. Because one, it was freezing cold that night. And two, the lake was actually partially frozen. And also the lake was really shallow, like only two feet deep. So Joanne would have had to wade through the water about a hundred yards to get to where it was actually deep enough to drown. And since she was wearing heels, it would have been really difficult to even get down to the water. Like the embankment was totally covered in ice and snow and it was pretty steep. And in the shallow section of the lake, the bottom is entirely rocks. So it would have been really hard to walk through all those rocks to get to the deeper area of the lake. And not to mention that drowning suicides are actually really rare and just hard to do. So it just seems like this would be hard to pull off for Joanne and really anybody. And what's so crazy is there wasn't even a hole in the ice. Like there was no sign that the ice had been broken where the footsteps were. There were some areas of the lake that weren't frozen because the lake was only partially frozen, but where the actual footsteps were and where she supposedly entered the water, the ice was not broken. So just how can you explain that in this suicide theory? Another crucial point against this theory is that Kelly said she doesn't believe Joanne would go anywhere near the water where she could possibly slip and fall into it. She says that Joanne was a very cautious person. In fact, a lot of people said she was quite cautious. Apparently she was just wary about everything and was actually afraid of water and the dark. So there's just so many reasons to doubt this suicide theory. And at this point, the family was sure that someone had taken Joanne that night. But despite all these inconsistencies and the family pointed all of these things out to police, they stopped investigating and just ruled her death a suicide without finding her body. Within an hour of finding her car, the police had already decided on this theory and wouldn't deviate from it or investigate further. 
Of course, it makes sense to search the lake because I guess the evidence did point to that somebody might be in there, but to stop there and not investigate further literally makes no sense. They didn't even consider any other possibilities and right off the bat were telling the family that it was a suicide, which it's just insane and extremely suspicious. So it's either just really shitty police work or a cover up because the family and many Netflix viewers cannot fathom why the police would see that evidence as a suicide. It just seems really weird how they stumbled upon her car and then launched this huge investigation so quickly. And within a matter of days had already closed the case because they saw some footsteps near a lake. Obviously it depends on where you live, but I feel like if I just left my car somewhere, it would get towed and I'd just get some big bill in the mail and like no one would care where I was or anything like that. Joanne's family held out hope that she was still alive out there somewhere, but as the days and weeks passed, they knew that that possibility was unlikely. Her disappearance was extremely hard on her family and her children, especially on her youngest son, Michael. He wasn't in the Netflix episode, but Michelle said that this whole thing has been really hard on him and he's still an emotional wreck over it. Apparently he can't even talk about Joanne. Michelle knew that since she was the oldest, she was gonna have to take matters into her own hands. Within a month of Joanne's disappearance, Michelle had already hired her own pathologist, scientists, investigators, and lawyers to help get to the bottom of what happened to her mom. Since the police, you know, they weren't even investigating anymore. The first PI she hired to help solve the case was Salvatore Rastrelli who was an expert crime scene investigator. And he said he's seen many cases where police think it's a suicide. And once they get that idea in their heads, they won't deviate from it and will do anything to prove their theory. Salvatore found many things that were done incorrectly or poorly during the investigation, but most shockingly was how poorly they had taken photographs of the footprints in the snow, which was their main piece of evidence for the suicide theory. Salvatore said that when he looked at these photographs of the apparent footsteps, all he could tell was that something had walked through the snow. He says it could have been anybody or anything based on the photographs. So they didn't try to get good photographs of the footprints. Like in the picture, you can barely even see what it's showing, like the flash is so bright. They also didn't try to prove that it was actually Joanne that made the footsteps. Like they didn't take any pictures of the footsteps with a scale beside it to compare it to Joanne's shoe size. When the police chief was asked about this, he said, no, it's not an exact match, but that some of the footprints seemed like they were made by a heeled boot. But of course there's no photographs showing this specifically. So Salvador did an experiment, a reenactment, if you will, of how hard it would be to walk down that embankment in four inch high heeled boots. He had a female volunteer put on high heeled boots and walk down the embankment. And no surprise, it was extremely difficult. And the experiment was done in warm weather, like not even in the winter. And he concluded that it would have been impossible for Joanne to walk down that embankment when it was covered in snow and ice in the shoes that she was wearing. Salvador thought the investigation was just done so poorly and atypical. And he thought that for the police to make the determination that she committed suicide so quickly with very little evidence was extremely suspicious, especially since her body was still missing. The next thing the family had to do was to try to find any witnesses that possibly could have seen something that night. It's so sad that they had to do all this investigating on their own, but yeah, they tried to retrace Joanne's steps from that night. The Romaine family was actually in court on the day of Joanne's disappearance because they were plaintiffs in a lawsuit involving black mold in their home. Michelle last saw Joanne when they left the courthouse that afternoon. Joanne left with Michael and Michelle left with David. At 6 p.m., Joanne dropped Michael off at their home and told him that she was gonna go fill up her car with gas for the next morning and that she would be back right away. At 6.25 p.m., she got gas at a local gas station and spoke with one of the employees while he pumped her gas. They were familiar with each other as she was a customer for a long time. And he says on that night, she seemed very cheerful and nothing was out of the ordinary. They had their normal conversations about their families and she talked about her children and then she left. After Joanne got gas, and as far as we know, she made the split decision to go to the 7 p.m. prayer service at her church. This was apparently very common, like she would just try to go whenever she could. And there were between 10 and 15 people at this prayer service, so it was a pretty small group. A witness confirmed that Joanne was at the prayer service that night. The witness was sitting in the front by the altar while Joanne was sitting in the back. When the witness turned around, she saw Joanne in the aisle and that Joanne apparently departed around 7.15 and 7.20 p.m. Michelle also hired retired FBI agent Bill Randall to help investigate. And he tried to interview as many witnesses as possible. 
and he spoke with a number of witnesses that were at the prayer service that night with Joanne. After leaving the service, so around 7.15 to 7.25 p.m., a witness said that she heard the car alarm on Joanne's car going off. The witness saw the lights flashing and heard the alarm for about 15 seconds and then it was turned off and she didn't really think anything of it at the time. Another witness thought that she saw the lights flash once to indicate that someone was like unlocking the car with a key fob, but she didn't see anyone near the car. And this is interesting, but a witness leaving the church at 7.25 p.m. only saw a black van parked in the church parking lot and didn't see Joanne's car there. And then another witness who left the church between 7.25 and 7.35 said she didn't see any cars in the parking lot. So this would mean that Joanne's car left the church parking lot and then came back later. Another witness said that she saw a man running by the water's edge around 7.50 p.m. and that he had a scarf around his neck, but he wasn't wearing a coat, which is weird, right? Because it was a freezing cold night. And police actually found a scarf near the crime scene and they weren't able to track down its owner. And then they didn't even keep it as evidence or anything. They just donated it to Goodwill. Bill Randall also pulled Joanne's phone records and found something pretty shocking. The week before her disappearance, Joanne had actually left a voicemail at a security company. She was trying to contact an investigator because she believed she was being followed by a person or persons unknown. And she was really concerned about this. In fact, Joanne had actually told her children that she thought she was being followed. And when her children asked her more about this, like who she thought it was, all she said was that it was somebody different every day. And she believed that these people were trying to learn her routine. Michelle says that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, Joanne seemed a lot more nervous than usual. Remember, she was a very cautious person typically, but apparently this was even more than usual. John also said that Joanne was acting very nervous, scared, and troubled and that she wouldn't tell him what was wrong, even though she normally told him everything. The PI also contacted some of Joanne's coworkers at the boutique that she worked at. And her coworker said that from January 7th to January 8th, Joanne was receiving more phone calls than usual. And she said that Joanne would actually walk away from the store to take these phone calls, which wasn't common for her. Apparently, Joanne also felt like her phone was being tapped and that people were entering her home. And she was so concerned about this that she actually had all the locks changed at their house. Michelle said that Joanne didn't want to go anywhere alone and in fact, the only place that she felt safe was at her church. So on Saturday, March 20th, 2010, so 70 days after Joanne's disappearance, the family's worst fears had come true when her body was found by two fishermen on Boblo Island. This island is located in the Detroit's River Livingston Channel in Amherstburg, Ontario. It was about 35 miles from where she allegedly entered the water. For Michelle, losing Joanne was like she had lost everything. And this was because she was the backbone of the family. It was a huge shock, a huge adjustment, and a huge loss for everybody. All of Joanne's friends and her family were just absolutely devastated, but they didn't stop. And they were even more motivated to find out what happened to Joanne after her body was found. Another investigator that Michelle hired was Scott Lewis. And he made the trip with her to Bubble Island by boat. And they both saw how far Bubble Island was from the church when they made the trip there. Scott Lewis said that the body traveling that far seems like a bit of a stretch. Joanne's body had to have traveled from the shallow water near the church down a shipping channel in the middle of the lake into the Detroit River and then went 30 miles downstream. At first, Lewis told Michelle that he wasn't sure if he wanted to get involved in Joanne's case. He said if there were any signs that Joanne's death was a suicide, that he wasn't gonna get involved. He said if he thought it was a murder, then he would get involved. He said that he didn't see any signs that Joanne's death was a suicide. One thing he pointed out was why would Joanne fill her gas tank that night if she was planning to take her own life? He also doesn't think it's at all possible that her body traveled that far without the helicopters finding her first. In fact, none of the investigators Michelle hired thought that the body could travel from the church all the way to Bablo Island, like it was just too far. To Michelle and her investigators, the only other possibility is that Joanne didn't enter the water where police say she did. And that a more likely scenario is that she was dumped somewhere down the river closer to Bablo Island. So when Joanne's body was found, it was in an advanced state of decomposition. As a result, forensic pathologists were unable to make a definitive determination as to the time of death but it was likely that her body was in the river for some time as algae and zebra mussels were stuck on her legs. A couple different coroners performed pathology on the body and they all had similar conclusions. They all found that Joanne's cause of death was drowning. However, they all said it was certainly possible that Joanne could have been dead before entering the water. 
Two forensic experts said that she actually died of dry drowning, which means there was no water found in her lungs. And this is interesting because it shows that her breathing was compromised before entering the water. But because the body was in such an advanced state of decomposition, they weren't able to determine if it was a homicide. So her matter of death was ruled undetermined, meaning they couldn't conclude if it was a homicide, suicide, or an accident. However, they did find two bruises on the upper portion of her left arm. And in the coroner's opinion, these bruises happened before her death. He says that these bruises could be coincidental, but they could also be the result of an assault. Which brings us to the next interesting point. They showed this in the Netflix episode, but Michelle still had Joanne's designer purse, the one that was found in the car, and it was purchased six weeks before her disappearance. And there's literally a rip in it. I hope I can find good pictures of this purse, but just to describe it a little bit in case I can't, the purse has ruffles all along the side, and one of the ruffles was totally ripped out and was just like dangling there. Michelle says that this rip was definitely not there and she had never seen it before. And Joanne was a fancy lady. Like she wasn't walking around with a ripped designer purse. Michelle also said that Joanne always carried her purse on her left shoulder, which is where the bruises were found. So to Michelle and her investigators, they believed even more that she was grabbed that night. However, the police chief said that this was just wear and tear on the purse. And because there was no damage to the strap of the purse, that it shows no sign of a struggle. And they never fingerprinted the purse or tested it for DNA either. Like, come on. They clearly didn't take this rip seriously at all. Another thing that just didn't really sit right with Michelle is that when Joanne's body was found, everything was zipped up. Like her keys were found in her coat pocket that was zipped up and all the pockets were zipped up and her coat was zipped up all the way to her chin. And Michelle said that Joanne never wore her coat like that. Two of her belongings were missing and those were her phone and her rosary. Apparently she would normally keep both those things in her pockets. Michelle says that the fact that her phone was missing points to foul play even more because if you were a criminal, the first thing you'd get rid of is someone's phone because it has a lot of data on it, possible evidence, and it can be tracked. Another thing that Michelle noticed was that Joanne's shoes showed no sign of distress. She says other than some clay from the river, they were in impeccable condition. While the police claim that she walked 100 yards out into the lake to drown herself and the entire bottom of the lake is rocky, yet her shoes had no scuff marks or any damage to them at all. So after a couple months of investigating and many interviews with witnesses later, Michelle and her PIs were able to piece together a theory of what happened to Joanne that night. They believe that Joanne was abducted while leaving the church. They believe she was attacked on the left side where she carries her purse and where the bruises are, and then was pushed into her own car while the abductor drove away with her in it. And then somewhere along the Detroit River, her abductor or abductors made her go unconscious somehow and then put her body in the water and drove back to the church and made the footsteps in the snow. Investigators don't believe that robbery was an element of this crime because other than her phone and rosary, no other items were stolen. Because of her odd behavior leading up to her disappearance, they believe it could have been someone that she was having an issue with, possibly a family member, and that it had to be someone that she knew, like someone who knew her routine and knew that she would probably be at the church that night. Whether it's actually a cover-up or not is still up for debate, but Michelle's investigators say the handling of the case is very suspicious. There are actually quite a few things that just seem unexplainable and definitely point to a cover-up. The first thing, and this is really crazy, is that the car that Joanne was driving, the silver Lexus, was actually registered to Michelle. So if the patrol officer ran the plates, Michelle's name would have come up. So how did they know that it was Joanne who was missing? And it's not like the family reported her missing or anything, so how would they know that? Like the police approached the family and said that Joanne was missing. Another weird thing is that the police reportedly told the Coast Guard that Joanne had been missing since 5 p.m. and that there was a hole in the ice, which both of those statements are untrue. And there's also a lot of uncertainty around how the police got a hold of Joanne's spare car keys. Like they did have a set of spare car keys to open the car and do forensic testing on it, but it's not clear how they obtained these keys. A police officer says that the day after Joanne disappeared, he went to their house and someone gave him the keys, but he can't remember who it was. And get this, Michelle claims that a month before Joanne's disappearance, Joanne told her that the spare car keys went missing, which is really suspicious. Another weird thing is that the police apparently dusted the outside and inside of the car for fingerprints. And when asked about this, the police said that they didn't find any usable prints and that the only prints that they found belonged to Joanne and her children, even though none of those prints were actually on file. Like they never fingerprinted them. So how would they know that the only prints found belonged to them? And this just really hits it home for me. 
but to prove that Joanne's car shouldn't have been suspicious to police, her investigators left a car overnight in the church parking lot. They left it in the exact same spot and left a purse and other items, just basically did an experiment to entirely recreate how the car was found. And you guessed it, it was never reported by police and it didn't even get a parking ticket. And they tried this on three separate occasions. This is extremely suspicious. I don't know if the officer who found the car that night was a keener and was just trying to go above and beyond, but I don't know, it just seems kind of weird. And that's kind of what I was saying before, how it was really weird how they just found the car and immediately launched this huge investigation. Okay, so now let's talk about potential suspects. Michelle told her investigators that there were a couple potential suspects. The first suspect that Michelle named was actually her father, David. According to Michelle, the reason they separated was because Joanne was fed up with their toxic relationship and just wanted to be happy. And before her disappearance, Joanne was actually gonna file for divorce. Like they had been separated for five years, but it seems like Joanne was ready to make it official and actually file for divorce. And as I mentioned before, according to Michelle, David was pretty angry with Joanne for leaving him. Michelle was not sure if he was actually involved or if he just hired someone to take care of Joanne for him. Joanne's lawyer who was representing her in her divorce with David said that in the week before her disappearance, she acted pretty strange and that she seemed distraught and paranoid. Joanne told her lawyer that David was really controlling and another employee at the law firm said that Joanne feared trouble from her husband. Michelle's PI contacted David for an interview, but he declined it and he wasn't in the Netflix episode. But apparently they investigated him pretty thoroughly and didn't find anything that would indicate that he was involved in Joanne's death. David had previously told police that after court that day, he had dinner with Michelle and just went home. And apparently his bank statements and cell phone records go along with this. And he also passed a polygraph test. Michelle's number two suspect was actually John, Joanne's brother, but she didn't think he did anything and said she thought that there could have been people out to punish him and she thought they might hurt Joanne as revenge. Turns out John has a pretty interesting past. Apparently he's had a lot of business deals that went south and he owes a lot of people money. Joanne and John's brother, Bill, also thinks that Joanne's death was a result of John's legal trouble. Michelle's investigators say this is entirely possible and if somebody wanted to get back at John, killing the most important person to him would be a good way to do it. And even John himself says that this is possible, but that he doubts it and he obviously has no idea who specifically would have done it. He says no matter what, he's really sorry that this happened and if it was because of him, he wishes that they would have just killed him instead. Michelle told police her number one suspect was Joanne's first cousin, Tim Matuk. And get this, he was a Harper Woods police officer at the time of Joanne's death. It's a little hard to tell from the map and I'm not like familiar with Detroit or anything, but it seems like Harper Woods is like the next division over from Gross Point Woods. Michelle says that she and John were actually estranged and other than one phone call shortly before her disappearance, they hadn't spoken in years. Michelle says that the family used to be really close and then in 1994, when Joanne's mother died, it just created a major divide between family members. And there was all that fighting over the inheritance and there were many falling outs between family members. According to Michelle, a few weeks before Joanne disappeared, Tim called Joanne and the two of them got into some kind of argument over the phone. Michelle doesn't know exactly what was said on this phone call but she heard her mother's end of it. And she said something like, how did you get my number? Never call me again. She could hear him yelling also on the other end, but she couldn't hear what he said. Joanne also said, I never said you were the root of everyone's problems. You just need to get your nose out of everyone's business. Leave me and my family alone. Never call me again. After this call, Michelle noticed that Joanne's face went entirely white. And she told Michelle that she might be in danger and that if anything happens to me, look to Tim and she reportedly feared him because he was a police officer and she thought he might have been using his connections to get information on John. When asked about this argument, Tim said Bill had called him and told him that Joanne had said that he was the root of all of John's problems. And so he was offended by this, so he called Joanne. And he was confused because he didn't think that Joanne had any problems with him. His side of the story is that he called her and said, why did you say that I was the root of all of John's problems? And apparently her response was, you're nothing but a big troublemaker. And then she hung up. Throughout all the interviews that Michelle's PIs did, it became really apparent that there was a lot of fighting between family members and a lot of hatred between them. And her investigators say that this makes it even harder to determine who could have been responsible for Joanne's death. Tim says that John asked him to not attend Joanne's funeral just to avoid any conflicts. 
so he didn't go. It seemed like there was especially bad blood between John and Tim. Michelle remembers that they were always butting heads and Tim was always sticking his nose in John's business. She says it's always been ugly between the two of them. And because Joanne and John were very close and she acted as kind of a mentor for John, it seems like she got mixed up in their feud as well. Michelle says that she keeps rehashing that conversation she had with Joanne about Tim and that even though she doesn't know exactly what was said on that phone call, her mother feared Tim and now she's gone. And it wasn't just Michelle who suspected Tim. Joanne's lawyer also came forward and told the PI to look into Tim because Joanne had told her, Tim said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. And one of Joanne's friends, who was actually a former FBI agent, also told the PI to look into Tim. Michelle also learned that Tim apparently gave a tip to police that Joanne was paranoid and suicidal, which is just ridiculous. And it just makes it even more believable that this was some kind of cover up because Tim had connections with the police officers. Tim obviously denies having anything to do with Joanne's death. He said he never participated in the investigation and he doesn't know any of the officers that were running the investigation. He claims that he wasn't in the area at the time of Joanne's death and that he was working with other officers at the time. Michelle's PIs looked into Tim extensively, but they weren't able to find anything that would suggest that he was involved in her death. In June 2014, Joanne's family filed a $100 million civil lawsuit against the city of Gross Point Farms and additional defendants for a conspiracy to cover up Joanne's murder. They alleged that the Gross Point Farms and Gross Point Woods Police Departments and several officers were protecting one of their own, presumably Tim, from being prosecuted for murder. They claim that the police falsified reports and only focused the investigation on suicide. And for this lawsuit, the family's lawyer uncovered a bunch of witness statements that were either straight up ignored or changed by police. One of those witnesses was named Paul Hawk, and he claims he saw Joanne with two men that night and the police didn't take his statement seriously at all. He claims he was driving near the church when he saw a woman matching her description sitting on the lake's break wall. He noticed two cars parked illegally on the lake side of the road with two men standing near them. He was worried that the woman was in danger because he said she seemed a little slumped over. As Paul slowed down and approached the vehicles, he noticed that one of them seemed to be a municipal one and that the other vehicle was a silver Lexus SUV. One of the men acted as if he had a gun in his pocket and motioned for Paul to keep driving, but Paul rolled down his window and asked what was going on and apparently one of the men said to get the hell out of here. A few days later, Paul heard about Joanne's disappearance on the news. So he went right to the Gross Point Farms Police Department to report what he saw. They asked him to like write it down and bring it back later or something like that. So he did just that. But according to the lawsuit, two years went by before anybody followed up on what he saw. And in 2012, Paul filed a property damage complaint and he thought that it was a message sent from someone to remain quiet about what he saw. But Paul wasn't gonna let this go and he actually went to the Michigan State Police and the FBI to report what he saw because no one from the local police departments were taking him seriously. And shortly after speaking with the FBI, a Gross Point Woods detective called him. And apparently this detective became very aggressive when he questioned Paul about why he spoke to the FBI. And the detective told Paul that he would be charged for obstructing the investigation. In 2014, when this lawsuit kicked off, Paul was shown a photograph of Tim and he positively identified him as one of the men he saw that night, which is absolutely nuts. And this wasn't included in the Netflix episode, which I thought was kind of weird. The lawsuit also claimed that another witness was just straight up ignored by police. Her name is Suzanne and she says police ignored her when she tried to report that she had seen a man walking in a strange manner, I'm not sure what that means, on Lakeshore Road near the church at approximately 8.25 p.m. that night. Apparently he was dressed in non-athletic apparel, so it wasn't like he was, you know, going for a run or anything. And when she last saw him, he was crossing the road towards the church. During the investigation, police claimed that a witness came forward and said that she saw Joanne walking into the church and apparently Joanne's body language indicated that she was depressed. Like, okay. But in the lawsuit, the witness swears that she never said that. The lawsuit also claims that the police departments didn't even investigate Tim at all, even though there were several people that brought up his name as a potential suspect. And obviously Michelle believes that this is because of his connections with the police departments. However, despite all these inconsistencies, in 2018, the lawsuit was dismissed by the courts. The US District Court judge says that although Joanne's death remains a mystery, the family was unable to prove their claims. 
The police departments obviously deny that there was any kind of cover-up and that they still believe that Joanne's death was a suicide. They believe that the family had a difficult time accepting this and that they just created this conspiracy. They also note that the family was unable to come up with a strong motive other than a family vendetta, which honestly makes no sense because the police say that the reason why Joanne committed suicide was because of being depressed over all the family feuds. So isn't that the same thing? And this is kind of interesting, but the police apparently didn't deem Paul's witness statement as credible because he changed his story a couple of times. Apparently he said he first saw the two men with the woman in the afternoon, but then at a later date, he said it was actually at dusk. And then later he said it was around 8 p.m. So these inconsistencies with the timing made police deem him not credible which might be why Netflix didn't include that in the episode. Police also explained that they felt like investigating Tim would create a conflict of interest, so they asked the Michigan State Police to investigate him instead. But no further investigation was done on Tim, so I'm not really sure what happened there. So what happened after the episode aired in 2020 was that Tim got a lot of backlash from the public and lots of news articles about his potential involvement in her death. So he actually did an interview with one of Unsolved Mysteries co-creators. In the interview, he once again denied being involved in Joanne's death. He says that there's no evidence and no motive against him. He also denied that the two were estranged and that apparently they were on good terms before the phone call. He also denies that the phone call involved any screaming or yelling and that there's no way that Joanne would fear him after that phone call. Tim also addressed questions regarding his alibi on the night of Joanne's death. He says he was working for the Michigan State Police's Narcotics Task Force that night. He says they were working on an active target and that they weren't allowed to leave the location because of the activity that was going on in their investigation. He also said that his alibi was corroborated by the Michigan State Police. Tim believes that the family knows that he had nothing to do with Joanne's death and they just created the whole conspiracy to get money out of the police which is convenient theories for him. Michelle says that the day that Joanne disappeared is the day that they lost everything. She says she misses everything about her, but most of all, she misses the warmth, love, and comfort she gave them. She says that's something she can never really get back. So where the case stands today is the police said they found insufficient evidence to suggest that Joanne was murdered or any type of crime was committed. They believe her death was a suicide. However, they were not able to obtain an official conclusion on her death. They consider her case open, but inactive, but there is still a $200,000 reward for this case. Anyway, guys, that's all I have for today. If you found this case interesting, please give it a thumbs up and let me know your theories on what you think happened to Joanne. I've always found this case interesting and it really stuck with me and I really hope one day more evidence will come out, but I honestly highly doubt it. It seems like the police have really just closed this case. Always leave your case suggestions in the comments below and let me know if there are any other cases from Unsolved Mysteries that you want me to do a video on. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time. Bye.